Carter. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management for Oracle Machine Learning, and I am going to walk through the features and functions of Oracle Machine Learning, uh, but also, I think more importantly, try to paint a, uh, a, a path, a journey, a career path that I don't think is that hard uh, for Oracle data professionals to evolve to become Oracle data scientists. And um, a lot of people will ask, well, is there a course, is there a certification, and so on. And right now, this is a set of uh, YouTubes and tutorials and blogs, and it's sort of a self-study, uh, and it's a template, it's a format, uh, if you will. It's a state of mind, I guess you could say, in some regards. But we are also working with Oracle University to codify this together into a whole course that you can take. And uh, there's a lot of free resources out there. And we are working on some um, certification um, for uh, basic uh, Oracle machine learning uh, knowledge. So there is more coming. But uh, I'll go through. Right now, you can, you can certainly do this. And, 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 and most of the uh, customers and customer references that I've been working with have come right up this same journey. So I think I'm going to walk through that uh, with you today. And the way that we do this at Oracle is the strategy of moving the algorithms, not the data. Uh, if you've heard me speak before, I oftentimes tell the story, the origins of the uh, machine learning development team here at Oracle. A lot of us came from another company uh, through an acquisition called Thinking Machines. We had separate algorithms, 20 or something algorithms that all ran on special hardware and special, you know, outside the database, if you will, right? When we got acquired, we said, hey, the data volumes are gonna get bigger and bigger over time. Data is big and getting bigger. Algorithms are small. They're just numerical recipes, equations, if you will. Why don't we move the algorithms, not the data? So that's the journey that we've been on for the last uh, 20 years. And Oracle Machine Learning has been a priced option to the enterprise edition of the database. Um, but as of December 5th, 2019, Oracle made the decision to make both the Oracle Machine Learning and the Oracle Spatial and Graph options uh, free, no, license, no additional license required features of the enterprise editions of the database, the SE2 versions, and the uh, anything on the autonomous database. So basically everything except the standard, you know, personal type of editions. Um, so that really opens up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunity. And I think it allows you to have a lot more uh, fun with your data and get more value out of it. So that's what we're going to be walking through in this, uh, in the upcoming uh, minutes here. Oracle uh, has a safe harbor statement, which basically says if I talk about futures, which I will, that it's a, it's not a commitment to release this particular piece of functionality by this particular date or time. So just be advised of anything I might say about futures. Um, the goal of this is to briefly uh, present the overall features, functions, capabilities, and, and really the true differentiators of Oracle machine learning. And then after that, to walk down a path of uh, share an attainable, logical, evolutionary path for Oracle data professionals to simply add some additional machine learning skills to their otherwise valuable and deep uh, Oracle data skills so they can extract more information from their data, uh, discover new insights, and actually to make predictions. So what I have found is it, it, it's been far, uh, it's been a far easier journey or path for Oracle data professionals to simply learn the concepts of machine learning, which are, for the most part are like automated concepts, right? It's how to set up a problem and get the data together and then kind of press go. I know there's more to it, but it's kind of like that, right? Um, versus uh, uh, the people that come in from a pure hardcore data science background who know only Python or TensorFlow or um, R or MATLAB or something like that, and they want to, but they don't know about the database. And when we move the algorithms inside the database, it opens this whole sort of world of opportunities for those two different skill sets to work together. But what I find is the people that already know and are comfortable with the database um, pick this up rather quickly. So let's hope you do too. So lately you've seen, uh, this is the most recent Oracle Open World. I sat up in front like I usually do, and I love it because uh, Larry was talking about my product, among other ones, but also my product, Oracle Machine Learning. And he was talking about one of the new features, AutoML, which automates a lot of machine learning. It's also the user interface that we're adding uh, up on the cloud on Autonomous. We call it the AutoML user interface. But he's talking about that and, and, and really in this larger sort of converged database concept. More on that in a minute. Um, he also announced a new mission statement. And um, I always say, you know, discover, uh, see the data in new ways, discover insights and unlock endless possibilities. I'm always reminded of that kid in the Bruce Willis uh, movie called The Sixth Sense, where, where the kid says to Bruce Willis, I see dead people. And I don't see dead people, I see machine learning. So when you see, you're going to say you're going to see data in new ways, discover insights and unlock endless possibilities, I don't know what else you might be talking about. So let's show you how you can extract more data and value out of the existing data that you have. 
Now, as I said, Oracle's been um, messaging and delivering functionality uh, towards this converged database um, uh, strategy, if you will. So the idea is that rather than many competitors who have a separate database for, say, JSON or unstructured data or graph databases or in-memory databases or OLAP and so on, Oracle over the years has always said, doesn't it just make more sense to make the database ever more capable? So keep on adding features and functions to this database to make it smarter and smarter and ever more capable. So that's what you know has been happening over all the years, these years. And uh, people are now referring to it as a converged database because it has so many features in it. I'm most excited about the one you know over on the upper right there, the machine learning, where now you can harvest more information, discover new insights, and make predictions. Because as I've said in the beginning, we move the algorithms to the data, not the other way around. And when you do that, it just opens up all these opportunities, I think, for you and for um, people who use this product uh, get more information and value um, and more competitive value out of their data. Now there are others at Oracle that can talk about the next two or three slides much better than I can, so I'm going to skip over this rather quickly, but the idea is that if you're a DBA, and this is not meant to be only DBAs, this I've sort of more generalized the, uh, the statement to say Oracle data professionals, regardless of you know sort of what part of the database they're touching from which point of view. Um, but, but operational database DBAs spend a lot of time on these kind of activities. And uh, the idea of the Oracle database is not just the autonomous database, but all of the Oracle databases uh, over the years uh, has been to um, do more and more automation, you know, self-driving, self-securing, self-repairing, but also, you know, much more, you know, the optimizer is a great example. Uh, there's just so many different things that the database does well and tries to uh, simplify and automate. And at this point in time, in 2020, even I can fire up an autonomous database in about two or three minutes and get it running and start machine learning uh, my data another minute after that. And it's pretty amazing what you can do these days. So with this automation that Oracle has been working on for you know ever since the beginning, uh, more and more automation allows the DBAs and other individuals uh, to move further up this value chain. And with all their skills and, and knowledge about the data and where the data is and what the data means and all of that, um, those valuable skills are just perfect to migrate into other um, uh, related uh, parts of uh, uh, the enterprise. And some of those would be becoming a data engineer to assemble and, and, and wrangle with the data, uh, dealing with data security, um, uh, application tuning. But the one I find the most exciting is the one in the upper right, the machine learning. So we're going to kind of continue down that path now. And you might ask, well, why would why would Oracle do so well in this space of machine learning? Well, it's like the bank robber, you know, it's like because that's where the data is, right? That's why you rob the bank, that's where the money is. Well, that's why you machine learn the data, perform the machine learning inside the database because that's where your data is. Now, if you do not have very much data in an Oracle database and you never intend to put any data inside of an Oracle database, most of what I'm going to talk about is probably not so relevant, right? This is really for people who see the value of the uh, industry leading you know, database and the idea of just not moving the data out of there and just do all your machine learning inside the database and speak to open source R, speak to open source Python, all sorts of yeah, REST APIs and all that, but just, just don't move the data. So when I talk about machine learning, I realize usually there's a range of uh, personas that, that might be listening. And uh, some people are new to machine learning and others are not. For those who are not, please forgive a couple of opening slides here, but a lot of people say, well, what is machine learning? And the idea is just, there's a bunch of different definitions. I do not call this deep learning, by the way. I think of that as more of cognitive image analytics and such. We have also support for that that other applications are using and such. But here we're talking about the, you know, the in-database machine learning algorithms that are primarily designed for business type of problems, I guess I'd say medical, you know, business, banks, manufacturing, whatever. But um, you know, the, 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 what I'd call mainstream machine learning. And depending on what you're trying to do, there are different types of machine learning there. There's supervised learning where you really have labeled data, like this is a good customer, this is a bad customer. This is somebody who defaulted on a loan, this is somebody that, you know, did not. The, this is a, a, a very good customer, a medium-sized customer, or a, or a not so good customer. So you, you have examples that are, that are labeled and you're trying to build a model to, um, predict those values. And if you have um, a number of categorical variables, like the, the one over here, the, the second one down, that's called classification. You're trying to you know, say you are a good or bad uh, credit risk. 
Uh, if you're trying to predict a value, like the value of a home, that would be typically called regression. Now, those are all supervised learning techniques, and of course, we have algorithms that support those. The other ones uh, go hand in hand with those. They're used for slightly different use cases, but also because the algorithms are all together in the same database, you can use these in interesting combinations. So if you're just trying to find, um, not just, but if you're trying to find uh, sections or clusters of customers or records and try to sort of group them together without any real supervision, that would be called clustering. If you're trying to find uh, rare or anomalous uh, transactions or events, like say medical fraud, that's anomaly detection. And you know, if you're doing the classical, you know, people who buy this also buy that, so therefore I think you might buy it, the association rule, recommendation engine kind of thing, that's called associations. And in the literature, if you go out and you say, well, where does machine learning apply? Because there's a, you can Google this, I've listed my links here at the bottom. There's a number of different places. Um, I'm not saying all these are the ones I completely agree with, but the ones in red are ones that I personally have had some involved with, uh, helping out customers, done some of the work myself, uh, or, you know, pretty pretty close to these things. And, um, and I think, well, uh, you know, I can validate those things. They seem to be a pretty good fit for my product. Um, but the way that we do this is interesting, at least interesting to me. And uh, the way we do this is we move the algorithms, not the data. I'll probably say that a hundred times throughout this, uh, this talk, but it's so important. If you look at the right, those of you who are sort of in the know will recognize that as uh, uh, the, the, the naive Bayes algorithm. It is basically a, uh, an algorithm that counts things. Uh, Lord Bayes came up with it, I think, in the 1700s, I think the paper was published. And uh, it really just says, if I'm trying to predict something, just count the number of uh, examples of when that happened in the past and figure out how many times they were a male or a female or a house owner or a house renter or a dog or a cat lover or if they have a numerical value like age you'll bin it into uh, you know 10 year deciles or low medium and high or something so you you discretize your data and you count things and well the database is really really good at counting things it does it in a paralyzed fashion it's just a complex query for us to build a naive Bayes model the association rules was the other algorithm that we initially put in the database way back going all the way back to 9.2 uh, each year, we added two or three additional um, high-performance power tool algorithms inside the database for classification, regression, text mining, sentiment analysis, fraud detection, feature extraction, uh, all sorts of different things. We also realized that not everyone who's a data scientist wants to always speak SQL. A lot of people were, over the years, using R, so we integrated with R, and I'll talk more about that and more recently Python, and so we now integrate with Python. When I say now, that's coming out in what's called the Oracle Machine Learning for Python. It's coming out uh, in the very, very near future, I guess is all we really get to say these days, uh, but that'll be coming out on the autonomous database. And when you have up to, I think we're over 30 algorithms, and there's also many, many statistical functions and analytical functions and SQL patterns and so on, but when you put this much math um, and machine learning algorithms inside the database, you have to kind of wonder, have you started to create what you might call an AI database? Is it a thinking database? I mean, now it's not just a dumb file cabinet that stores your data and protects it and serves it up quickly, right? When you call up a record, you might say, here's Charlie Berger, but here's the probability that he's going to default on a loan. Here's the probability he's going to have an unplanned surgical readmission. I mean, every single thing that you could want to predict, you could very easily predict um, inside the database in seconds or minutes maybe hours at worst, and now everything you call up out of that database is not only the historical factual records, but also predictions, probabilities in those predictions, reasons why we make those predictions, and you can do this for pretty much every variable that you bother to store. The product is called Oracle Machine Learning. Uh, it used to be called Oracle Machine Learning, uh, well, it used to be called Oracle Data Mining, Oracle Data Miner, that name still exists for the Oracle SQL Developer uh, extension. Uh, but it's gone by various different names. We've kind of got control of our senses and now call it Oracle Machine Learning. And OML extends the database and enables users to build AI applications and analytical dashboards. Um, it delivers these powerful in-database algorithms that are they're native, parallelized in-database implementations of, say, decision trees, support vector machines, neural networks, all these kind of things. They're, they're not running R. They're not running Python. They're our, our own intellectual property or many patents on these things that's you know Oracle spends a lot of time embedding these algorithms into the kernel of the database 
Um, and that's the power. You know, that's how we can build models on hundreds of millions of records in seconds or minutes. Um, we also integrate with open source R, and we will very soon integrate with open source Python. So you can do two or three different things. You can speak R, you can speak Python to drive these same 30 plus algorithms. So speak your native tongue, but drive our algorithms, which is really, really powerful. And if there's something that you need to do that is not in our list of algorithms, which I'll show in a second, you can do callouts and you can run local R or run the packages of Python that we have available for you on the autonomous database. So it really does you know, pretty much everything you would do with open source, but the main power is you can speak your native tongue to use the algorithms inside the database, not move the data. It's all HIPAA compliant, all of that. Now, uh, the other thing is, as of December 5th, we said no uh, license, uh, no extra cost. It's included in the database license. And a lot of people uh, just almost don't believe this or their management doesn't believe it. And they, they really want to have proof that they're not going to have the lawyers come after them. No, this is free. You can use that. And I can't hear you on the phone right now. So to, to, uh, to uh, uh, anticipate your reaction, I added this build. Wow. <laughs> Hopefully you're saying, wow, that's pretty impressive. I did not know that. That is really, really cool. So now it's, uh, I feel like Santa Claus. Everywhere I go, it's like, hey, did you know you have all these algorithms? You too can use them. Now they're also being uptaken and embedded into other things. So I'll show a little bit at the end about it, the Oracle Analytics Cloud that can now uptake our algorithms and register a model and score a model and view the results. We're also embedded in more and more applications. So it's really been exciting times for us in the Oracle Machine Learning Department. Um, why? Well, one of the reasons why our algorithms uh, and our architecture are better than other architectures, I'm not going to say our algorithms are way, way, way better than other people's algorithms. I think all algorithms are good, and I think we have very, very good algorithms, maybe the best on the planet. But I think the real differentiator between someone else's solution for machine learning and ours is, is the architecture. Okay, it's, 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 like, it, it's this issue that Fern Halper uh, uh, picked up on in her study. Uh, imagine I've built a model in Python, R, SAS, SPSS, Watson, Oracle, whatever. How long does it take for you to put that into operational use? And if you look at the numbers from three to five months down to nine months, which probably goes down to never, right, infinity, uh, I think it's 65% of the population takes that long to deploy or operationalize a model. Um, that's amazing, and that's validated with so many customers that I speak to. I mean, the people that have been doing amazing things with machine learning, doing it sort of the hard way with, with, with R or, or Python or, or whatever. Um, with us, we, 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 we do it all inside the database. So this is now my, my editorial comment. This is, this is Fern's study here. This is Charlie's editorial comment. They must be using products like that because if they were using Oracle, um, it would, I can't believe it would take so long. And in fact, I'm going to chug over here to a quick little demo thing just to kind of show you what I mean by that. I'll cover, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but this is a nice, simple little uh, Oracle data mining, uh, data miner demo. I'm also going to, just for those of you who are kind of saying, well, what about the, what about the notebooks up on the cloud? Well, I got to make sure I don't have that. Uh, where is it right here? Oh, I knew it was going to time out on me or whatever. Is that it? That's not it. Um, that's not it. I'll have to. I also had this going right here. I get no. That's not it. Um, I will launch that as well because I wanted to show that live. But um, you have a dump, number of different ways you can come in and access. I think it timed out on me. There's a number of different ways you can access the software uh, under the hood. Um, when I call up a notebook here, or when I call it from R or Python or uh, or the SQL developer, it's calling these. I'm just going to launch that notebook there, and so have them at the ready. But when I when I when I pull up one of these um, one of these algorithms, uh, like here, I've built several different models. Um, when I do that, I'm going to go over here and say, where are my properties? There are the properties. So when I do this, it's building. Um, whoops, didn't want to do that. It's building um, a GLM, a supported action machine, a decision tree. I'm only pushing the decision the one of these downstream here, but it's doing the 60/40 split. It's doing a lot of stuff here. But when it builds the model, I'm trying to get that guy's edge there. When it builds the model here, and I can generate the code for this, deploy the code or copy and generate the, um, uh, the code from any one of these uh, nodes. When I do that, under the hood, what it's doing is it's running um, code that looks like this. Okay, begin DBMS data mining, create model. Now, there's two different ways of doing this. There's also a create model, too, which I don't have to have the settings table up here. But here's the settings table that I'm going to explicitly instantiate and say that's what I want to do with support vector machine. Here's how I build a model. 
And again, I'm showing this because this is what it's running under the hood. Whenever I call from a GUI, from a button, from an application, from a notebook, it's calling this parallelized um, DBMS data mining create model function. And then when I say, well, just show me the top five most suspicious records, there they are. And if I say, well, I'd just like to do that whole thing over and over again, I'm building models and showing the results just like that, you know, sort of as fast as lightning. And I could do that over and over and over again, whether or not I use a notebook, uh, I mean, a, a drag and drop GUI, or use the notebook over here, which is finally populated, um, or however I'm doing that, when I, when I build all my different models down here and compare them, uh, when I get my results, um, it's the same sort of thing. It's building a model uh, right here. Okay, this is a random forest model. It should look very similar to what I just showed you with the create model two function. So my point in showing that is we excel in not only algorithms and parallelized algorithms and building models, but moreover, we excel in helping you operationalize these things, put them to actual use. And a little known fact is that 87% of data science projects fail to make it into production. So my uh, message to you is not with our stuff. Our stuff works great. And hopefully, as you uh, move from an Oracle data professional to an or and add Oracle data scientist skills, um, you can um, you can you can kind of change the tide here and make every single thing that you work on go directly to production because it's you know just take a model, you can move it from one database to another production database, move the scripts and so on. So a little bit more detail now on the product, and then we'll go into the the concept of the changing role and the journey of how to get from here to there. Uh, in terms of functionality, it kind of depends on where you're operating, right? If you're operating up on the cloud, we've been spending a lot of time and effort working on uh, notebooks. And we also have a new user interface that I alluded to before called AutoML. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, on premise, we have RStudio. You can drive the algorithms from, from R, and it kind of does that handshake back to the uh, SQL functions. Or you can do callouts uh, to R. Uh, in those cases, you're working on a sample of the data. But when I build this box plotter, so I'm... Um, I'm doing the in database statistical functions to render the, the values that would be used to, to draw those box plots, those boxes. Um, I can use SQL Developer, which I think I just showed you a second ago, but I've got different user interfaces here. And if you had clouded customer, you'd be using this over here probably. Um, and I can run, the, run these uh, in any database I have on premise or premises or in the cloud. Um, I also think it's always important to talk about uh, the data that might be outside of the database. And in the concept of big data, you may have lots and lots of data outside the database. Um, I do think that when you think it through about the problem you're trying to solve and what variables you need to assemble together, you know, as attributes to feed into a model, oftentimes the data that's outside of the database is sort of raw, um, um, detailed data that may need to be boiled down. And uh, I always say boil down the data lake into counts, totals, changes over time, uh, develop these engineered features uh, that you then feed in and join to the rest of the data that may be stored in the database. And together that whole um, 300... Charlie? Yeah. Charlie, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I'm getting a couple of requests for you to move the bar menu so they can see the whole presentation. Is bar menu up here? Is that actually in the... Yeah. Can... As I told you, I changed my panel. Okay, I'll try and put that... Uh, I'm going to put them here we down. Go. I'm going to put them way over here. Hopefully that works. All right, thank you for that. Thanks, all. All right, thank you. Um, so... So, um, so the, the, the idea is that you, you probably want to assemble the data from a variety of different sort of data sources uh, and then pull it together. And the centroid of all that assembled data is anywhere near the database, then just continue right on using the database to do, uh, to do your math there and build your models and deploy the models there. In terms of the features and functions that we have, this is going to be a pain over here. I wish I could uh, hide floating meeting controls. Aha, I think I just figured that out. Sorry about that. Um, so in terms of the algorithms that you are going to use, we have uh, several classification algorithms, several clustering and so on, several regression models. These are all, as I said before, our own in-database implementations of these. Uh, if you want to use R or Python, we integrate with R and Python, and we'll do that in two or three different ways. We'll cover that in more detail in a second. But uh, the idea is whether or not you're speaking R, Python, SQL, GUI, or Notebook, you're driving this collection of over 30 algorithms. Um, to do things like uh, hierarchical k-means clustering, uh, logistic regression, and so on. And I think what's the really powerful, interesting part of this, among many, is in the fine print. If I want to do a partitioned model of uh, all of the people who are going to vote for candidate A versus candidate B, and I want to partition that by state and by gender, it's going to launch 100 different models, just as a partition by clause within the database. 
If I have transactional data for how many medications you may be taking, and I'm counting the number of opioids you're on, I just do an aggregation of all those, and I could even do, and I feed in the nested transactional data, I could even do cleverly derived variables like what's your amount of opioids you've been taking versus the population average. If I have unstructured data like marital status, I always joke, is a, is a paragraph or a number of tweets or an email or a prenuptial, well, we use Oracle text under the hood to tokenize that data and bring us in uh, uh, a vector of terms that come in as a nested uh, kind of column of data. So we're not just your standard two-dimensional table that we're analyzing uh, the data, you know, performing the machine learning on. We, we do so much more than that. And because we can build and, and, and develop these models all together in the database, it also opens up, I think, combinatorial opportunities. So the output of a clustering model could go as the input into an anomaly detection model. Now, I've also listed a couple of the new algorithms, XGBoost and MS, MSET SPRT, which I'll talk to in a minute. Uh, but under the hood, when we run these things, it is just, as I showed you before, begin DBMS data mining, create model, buy insurance, the name of the model, that's the type of function. Uh, and here, when I want to score it, it's as straightforward as I showed you before. And if I want to do not classification, but I want to do attribute importance, well, it's just attribute importance, and I get my results. And if I say, no, I don't speak SQL, I speak, I speak R. Well, I just use the R syntax to drive the same uh, function. I get the same 0.2161. And in the very, very near future, if I say, well, actually, I speak Python, then you can call the same function from Python syntax and drive uh, the same, you know, attribute importance algorithm. But you're, you're doing it as a Python user. Speak your native tongue. You shouldn't have to change. So we try to support that sort of a collection of, uh, you know, takes a village of data scientists, I guess, these days, and data engineers and everyone together. Um, if you're going to use the GUI, uh, we have the Oracle Data Miner user interface that is just an extension to SQL Developer. And I showed a little bit of that before, uh, but I am just going to uh, uh, press this little video here while I talk uh, to this one. So you see, um, just so I can kind of think and talk and not have to do everything, but you, you see the data miner that you launch. Um, you have the connections. Uh, this does not, a lot of people ask, does this run on ADW? No, it does not. Um, on ADW, we're going with the new uh, notebooks and something I'm going to show you as a you know, as an auto ML user interface. They always say, you know, skate to where the puck is going to be, and we, we think we have a, hope we have a better user interface for you to migrate to up on the, on, on the ADWs. Uh, if I want to see the data, I just kind of use an explore node. Under the hood, it's running all the statistical functions that I think I talked to before. It's very uh, simple and easy to kind of visualize that data. All of these are in database calculations of mean, min, max, median, standard deviation. Here we're doing an attribute importance. So we're saying for the target field by insurance, what are the most powerful variables for predicting that? And there they are. So I've just done that. It'll run in about, you know, two, three, five seconds or so in the database. Uh, here I'm building several different uh, classification models. Um, I could change the input from, uh, uh, you know, marital status could be unstructured data and so on. I think I might do that. Maybe not. Um, I have all the different settings now. Those settings are what I deal with when I do the model settings or in the Create Model 2 version. I explicitly declare those things. We have defaults for all of that um, in the user interfaces we provide, but you can also, of course, override those for any kind of application. At the end of all this, I think what I do is try to view a couple of different models. There's a decision tree, see the different results. I know I'm going through this quickly, but the idea is, you know, there's a GUI and, it, and you can learn how to use it. It's not so hard. And there are tutorials for this, and I always make the offer. I love talking machine learning, so if anybody really wants to get into this stuff, I'm happy to sort of work with them. This last feature is what I think is really cool, the, the um, prediction details, which gives the exact reasons why um, we make each of those predictions. So that's that, and if I were using R, well, I talked about how that works. We use the R to SQL pushdown, and over here, I'm just gonna do the same sort of quick little video stepping through. Notice at the beginning how I make that handshake from the world of R to the world of uh, OML inside the database. I, I load all these packages, and the packages like the stats package and the data mining package and the models, those are the sort of handshakes between the syntax of R to those matching functions inside the database. So here I'm, you know, perusing the data. Now when I do the histogram, I'm not doing it in R entirely. I'm, I'm doing a scan of the entire billions and billions of records in the database and scanning the min and the max and counting the bins and then rendering all those results back to the R visualizing visualization, just like I do in the box plot here, I compute the statistics in the database using the functions, the in database functions I showed you before. So it's really, you know, pretty powerful. If I do something silly like just do a regular old visualization plot, well, I'm not adding any value there. That's just pure rendering of, uh, of data as I'm doing here. But if I do the analytics, 
I'm going to do that powerfully inside the database. Moving on, we have the Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks, which I think I, I glossed through before, but they are very, um, they're, they're, they're really nice. I like them because you, you document everything you're doing for others that you're working with. Um, you can use Markdown language, you can use SQL, very, PL SQL. Very soon you're going to be able to use Python as well. So a team of people can collaborate. Can collaborate. Uh, you can share the notebooks, you can publish the notebooks, other people can run them, and they sort of document your whole logic or thought process. In the very near future, we're coming up with the uh, Python uh, addition to these notebooks, Oracle Machine Learning for Python. So in those paragraphs, I could also speak Python and off I go. Now, I think before I I kind of covered this quickly, so I'm, oops, I didn't want to do that. I think I covered this quickly. So over here was a notebook, and I think I want to go hide floating meaning controls. Okay. So if I go back over to here, here's a nice simple notebook. This is the same one that I showed in that in that little Oracle Data Miner GUI. Who's going to buy insurance? And you can kind of see this whole thing. I think I ran this thing just earlier today. Is today the 11th? Yeah. And I ran this earlier today, and I did uh, stratified sampling here, a little bit of code for how to do stratified sampling. I built a model here. Five seconds to do an attribute importance. That seems kind of odd uh, that it would take that long. Four seconds to build a naive base. Five seconds to do a generalized linear model. Uh, five seconds, three seconds. I think it's the first time I ran it. If I ran it other times, it's usually like a second or two. Um, I compare the models. I get my results. And I can just leave all that data in the database to actually come back in. And this is a different one. I don't know if it's still going to work. Yeah, it might still be working. But I might want to just leave those results in the database and come back and look at these results using something. This is now I switched gears into predicting employees that might voluntarily leave. But now I can use the sort of faster search features of Application Express. Or as I started to say before, we have new integration with um, Oracle Analytics Cloud that I can talk to. I think a few slides on that. But we, we, you know, we're at the center of the data with the algorithm. So you can use a lot of different sort of touch points to, to visualize these results. So notebooks are one of them. And there's the Python language that's, that's adding uh, later on. And as I alluded to before, depending on what part of Python and R you're using, you would use it in three different ways. You would use the transparency layer, where you speak your native tongue, R or Python, and it drives the um, uh, in-database functions. So you can just do you know straightforward push down, you know, select the data or so. But more powerfully, you can use the in-database OML for SQL functions, you speak in your native tongue. And you can also do callouts. So a lot of customers will say, well, Charlie, I, I see most of what I need there, but there's this last 5% that I want to do, or I want to experiment and prototype and play around with stuff. Can I do that? Yeah, you can use the uh, pure open source uh, R Python to play around and experiment, or you can use embedded R or embedded Python to make callouts to you know, scikit-learn or things like that and do whatever you want. Um, so you have the option of doing all of those things. And then one of the newest thing, thing that is coming is this Oracle Machine Learning for Python. Which and these are the Python packages that are coming on uh, autonomous, just so you can get a quick uh, look at that or take a screenshot if you like. Um, and so the auto ML is the new thing that that is now going to do a lot of uh, automation. So we're gonna we've done some work with Oracle Labs who have done some clever things on having a sort of meta model that says, well, based on this data and the cardinality of the data and the type of data, I can kind of rule out certain algorithms and kind of focus more on other ones. I can then do this process of machine of feature selection and reduce the number of features by identifying the best ones that improves accuracy. And then I go through this exhaustive, uh, you know, the smarter version of the uh, uh, hyper auto tuning of the hyper parameters to, to get the best model. You can save that model, you can rebuild that model, or every time you go, you can just say, "Build me the best model right now on the fly using AutoML." So it's really intended to enable non-expert users to leverage Oracle machine learning. And there's a new user interface, as I said, uh, coming um, on the autonomous database called the AutoML user interface. So this is a click, click. Uh, it'll generate the notebook code. The nice thing about it is uh, once I, I uh, build a model, I can go through and, and look at the different, uh, what we're calling experiments, shotgun a bunch of different models in an intelligent fashion, uh, see the results and to see the different accuracies and then actually go and do model uh, management, model deployment, uh, a model leaderboard, REST APIs. There's a lot of uh, uh, exciting new things coming in this, in this world, in this realm of the AutoML user interface. Uh, and also as we kind of wrap up the overview of the product, uh, we also have some new algorithms, the XGBoost and the MS, MSET uh, SPRT. Uh, MSET SPRT has been something that's been big in process monitoring, and it's been very clever, uh, many patents on this for, for uh, having very f a few false positives and being able to uh, 
you know, detect, say, in a nuclear power plant has been one of the many use cases of this. Uh, if there's a problem as, as a very sort of intelligent early warning system, we're very excited to add that. Uh, and then also the very popular uh, XG Boost algorithm we're adding into uh, the 20C release. So, so we're always trying to add more smarts to the database. And I think it's the last slide. Um, everything that we do is, is really fast. So here, 640 million rows, the airline on-time data set, uh, a properly sized uh, box, I think it's 512 degrees of parallelism, but we're building GLM models, you know, linear LGM mo L GLM models, 900 attributes in a minute, okay? So pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And if you start to buy into this logic that I have all this data, uh, then you start to say, well, I have all this data, why don't I just start building some models, and for everything I have, I might as well just build a prediction and have a probability in the database. Um, I could see another variable, bank funds, I could make a prediction of that, and I could sort of focus on the people that have different values. You know, their actual bank funds is six million, but I predict that they're supposed to be 35. I may want to call in that customer in for a discussion and say, hey, do you go to the Cayman Islands a lot? Why don't you store your data, your, your money with us? So. All of that to build up to this. So hopefully what you're looking at, you're saying, hey, I think that kind of makes sense. I think I can I can pick up those skills. It, it sort of is common sense in so many ways, right? You, 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 um, you have your data, you know your domain, you know your business problems, and you just have to kind of map that into some, some algorithms. So this has been exciting for me. I've seen a lot of people move from the realm of uh, not just a DBA, I guess I've used even in this slide, it says database developer. I've actually changed that all the way to Oracle Data Professional to Oracle Data Scientist. So I think that's a more generic way of saying that. But basically, if you can spell SQL and you know the database, um, even if you can't spell SQL, if you're just sort of an analytical person uh, and you're and you're comfortable with Oracle, then it's it's not such a hard journey. And the idea is also that you're probably already doing a lot of this work already. Depending on your role, you're probably helping with data extraction, data wrangling, deriving new attributes, deriving new attributes attributes, which is what we would call feature engineering. And there's this little part in the middle where the machine learning magic happens. And I kind of like Penn and Teller, I like to kind of peel back that, you know, magical trick and show you it's not that complicated. I think I think once you see what happens here, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then you can import the predictions and insights, but you don't need to import them anymore, right? You can, you can kind of skip that step. You don't have to translate and deploy the models. You can almost kill those two steps because you're just building the model in the database, scoring the model in the database, move it to a production system, you're done. So I'll try to convince you of that in, a, in the next few slides. So there's this very common methodology, CRISP-DM. It's cross-industry standard, something or other for data mining, which is what we used to call machine learning. And it really just says there's these very, very motherhood and apple pie kind of steps, business understanding, data understanding. And I used to think this was, was overly simplistic. I was kind of involved a little bit with, had some fingerprints on the creation of this thing. And I, I, I thought it was just, you know, they were, trying, they were trying to get everybody to agree to something. And I thought it was just the lowest common denominator. Like it's so simple, uh, you, you gotta be kidding me. But it's held up over all the years because it is so simple. It's just so basic, but not enough people pay attention to it. So there are these basic steps. You really need to understand your business and define your business problem well. You need to then understand the data and maybe assemble the right data that you need build some models, evaluate the models, and deploy them. But this process, I'll go into more detail, um, it has a number of sub-processes, okay? Business understanding, there's a well-defined business problem, and so on. Now, by the way, I've been writing a blog series that's been, you know, a series. I think I just pushed out uh, week four. Now, week three is out there. Week four is under review. Go out there very, very shortly. But, you know, it's almost like writing a book. Like, how do you go about this whole process? Um, well, you need to have a really well-defined business problem. That's week one in this sort of journey I'll talk about. Uh, week two is uh, data understanding. You really need to assemble the right data. And there's, it seems like there's a lot of steps here, right? But the good news is the ones I've dimmed, we try to put automation towards that. We try to do stratified sampling. We try to have automatic handling of missing values and binning and normalization and dealing with unstructured data. So all you're really left to do manually is the stuff that's in the, in the bold. And that's really mostly using your domain knowledge to assemble the right data, to find uh, some engineered features, uh, and so on. So now we'll kind of continue down this path. At the end of this, you'll be a, you'll be, you know, in, in concept, a, uh, an Oracle data scientist. Now you will have to go off and do the homework and practice doing each of these different steps. And the way I think of that is, if you just really thought and read some some articles or, or followed our tutorials and walked through this, uh, kind of like 
you know, I'm trying to learn how to play the guitar. If, if, if I learn one chord and play that on week one, and week two I do something else, and week three I do something else, if I really just kind of focus on that, then, then I, eventually at the end I can, I can get better, right? And so business understanding is the very first one. Um, we'll cover that in a second, but the Oracle Data Miner GUI has nodes for each of these things. So data uh, understanding, data preparation, modeling, that's why we built the nodes. That's what these things do. And so we really try to automate and simplify that for you. And on the autonomous database, we have all these notebooks, these example notebooks that we ship. So when you go to the autonomous database, go over to the examples, you'll see all these. You can open them up, look at them, change the data to your own data, press go. It's, it's, it's kind of you know, relatively easy. I've seen a lot of customers pick up on this you know, pretty quickly, and I hope you do too. Give me a call if, 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 you, if you struggle. Um, so week one, business understanding. You need to start with a well-defined business problem statement. Now, I always say, and in the blog I wrote, you should expend some like 40% of your mental energy on this step. Now, that seems silly because you just say, I want to find my best customers, or I want to sell more shoes, or I want to detect fraud. Um, they all sound pretty good, but, but they're, they're, they're hidden with a lot of different problems on here. And the one at the bottom is the one I hear and see the most often, and it's also absolutely the worst one. Do not say, do not accept, hey, I've got all this data, can you mine it and find useful insights? That is just a recipe for failure. So what do you do? You have to think like Albert thought, you know, and he always had this thing, says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem statement and five minutes thinking about the solutions. And you really, you know, if you're trying to save the planet, would you, what does that mean? You know, all the men, women, and children are just the children. Uh, all the animals and trees, what about them? Do you have to save the planet for, you know, five minutes while a meteorite, or, you know, an asteroid or something whizzes by and then beam them back down? That would be a different thing than, you know, than, than other ones. Um, so think about the problem statement as carefully as you possibly can. That is probably the most important thing I'm going to pass along. Um, in this presentation and do not get caught in the sand trap uh, is what I'm calling it, the sand trap of poorly formed problem statements and I've seen it you know many many times working with with customers you know I want to combat fraud I want to predict customers that churn who are my best customers uh, all these kind of things it, it, you're just gonna get caught into a you know a, a lot of problems that are gonna have to do a lot of rework so here is uh, what I mean by that predict employees that leave sounds pretty straightforward what about the ones you fired what about the ones that are on paternity or maternity leave? What, what do you do about them? What are the ones that? What about the ones that retired? And do you have properly labeled data that said these are the employees that left that I did not want them to leave? And if you do, then you want to, you know, what you need to do is flag those employees as a one or a zero. Yes, no, uh, they voluntarily left. And then you need to think about that and say, well, I would like to know what they look like, you know not five minutes before they walked out the door I'd like to know what they looked like five months or three months before they, they they gave you know before they left because you know did they have a marital change did they did someone else around them get promoted over them uh, what happened I, I'd like to really sort of understand that so if I really carefully define the problem then that kind of pretty obviously maps into a classification type of um, mining function doesn't really matter so much if it's a support vector machine or decision tree or naive base we'll shotgun all of them in auto ml will do the same thing but it's a classification problem and you need to think about assembling the right data that supports that but you have a very carefully defined uh, uh, business uh, statement there if you say uh, down here how can i make more money well i know a, a major uh, restaurant uh, coffee kind of company that said well really most of my money i make off of selling iced coffee and coffee uh, the regular meals I don't make quite the margin on so I want to know what can I do to sell you know soft drinks coffee iced coffee things like that um, who are my best customers well what's your definition of a best customer well you may think about taking all your customers and and do you mean best customers this month or best customers over uh, a three-year window uh, like a lifetime um, maybe a subscription who who sticks with that sub that you know streaming music just subscription for the longest stratify all those customers take the top 20 percent and then I want to build a classification model focusing on that so you really need to think about the uh, business uh, pro uh, understanding and come up with an extremely specific problem statement um, and in the notebooks if you do this you can write down your whole thought process and what the business problem is uh, in the notebooks and pass those along for other people here we're targeting the best customers who have good credit and also finish all their payments Okay, and then we want to look at that and say, well, yeah, there they are in a, in a graph, and there are fewer of people who 
uh, our good credit customers that make all their payments, they're hard to find. There's only like, what, 20% of them, most of them. And we've sampled that down, Bob, obviously, right? We sampled this down. Um, but these are the people I'm looking for. And, uh, and so I really have to kind of think through what is the target field? What is the label of data that I'm going after? Week two, well, now I want to review the data. What's the data that I have? Does all this make sense? Are the ages all between zero and, I'd say, 120? Are the incomes monthly, weekly? Are they all valid? Um, are the loan amounts valid? Are all these values of data, you know, reasonable? And this is another data set. This is out in the um, Analytics and Data Oracle User Community GitHub, actually, is where we posted this and a bunch of other ones. If you're using the notebooks, you can have a number of different visualization uh, techniques, scatter plots, histograms, and so on, where you want to, you know, do simple exploratory graphs to understand the data, to make sure your data is valid. And if you use an Oracle Data Miner, we have the same type of facility. Now, the statistical functions to calculate the min, the max, and the render all these graphs are all performed inside the database, and it makes it easy. Now, um, in week three, we're up to data preparation. So now we're going to prepare the data, uh, create new derived variables or engineered features. And this is, I think, the second place where you really can use your domain expertise um, to, to really add value. Like, I, as, a, as a data scientist or as a business, uh, you know, trying to solve a problem, I don't really care about your date of birth, right? Well, if someone says, I have all this data, I have their date of birth, I don't care about the date of birth. I care about their age. Or I care how long have they been a customer of, if I know when they did their first transaction, I want to know, well, how long has it been, been since the, their last transaction? Something like a recency, frequency, monetary type of calculation. So you really want to think about all these new derived variables. I'm working with this one uh, customer that comes to mind just lately who does uh, a certain type of fraud, and uh, check fraud, actually. And it was just interesting hearing the, the expert talk about, oh, yeah, well, you know, if you write a check here and then there's a distance to over to there, we track that. And, and all the different sort of domain expertise, how many checks have you written in the last uh, week or month versus how many are you typically writing, uh, those are SQL uh, windowing functions to use for things like that. So you really want to think about not just the data you have, but deriving what we in the machine learning business call uh, engineered features. And so in um, the product, we also have uh, um, features and functions for dealing with uh, data preparation, identifying missing values, outliers. And if you use something we call automatic data preparation, ADP, it'll do all this sort of for you automatically. Here's the um, Oracle Data Miner column filter node that does this, um, and it does a, a lot of uh, things for you. Um, it will also, in each algorithm, have automatic data preparation. So if you don't do it, um, well, you just when you run the algorithm, you just say, I want to have eight, eight automatic data preparation on, and it will uh, uh, deal with all these kind of things automatically. Um, the other thing that uh, is actually back here, I thought I was going to show this in a different view, but uh, notice this attribute importance. If I sort that, I would have the most important attributes there appearing. Um, when I do that with the notebook, I've done it right here. I'm doing this create model two attribute importance. And here are the variables that are the most uh, influential on my uh, business problem, which is trying to find good credit customers who not only have good credit, I could just get a FICO score for that, right? But they also have purchased a flat screen TV or an air conditioner or a refrigerator on a payment plan and they complete, they complete all their payments. Um, so you want to know what are the key variables for that? That's just an attribute importance. So notice that we're up to week four, and it's the first time we're actually really doing any real machine learning, and we're doing the simplest of them all. We're doing an attribute importance, which is just a triage of the variables that are, that are, that are influencing my business. Now we're up to week four, where we're starting to do some, some models. And I always find that uh, people find this, you know, like uh, curious, like how do I know how accurate my model is? So, you know, it's 88% accuracy. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's simple. We do a 60-40 um, or 70-30. We have we take we don't build the model on all the data. That would perhaps build a model that overtrains, overfits on the data. So we, we we hold back some data. And so with all the historical data, we just take some of the data, maybe 60% of that data. So all the data that's in there don't need to mine it on 300 million records, 300 billion records. That's another issue. But if I do have 100 million records or 100,000, I just take say 60% of that 100,000, 100 million. And I take the other 40%, the remaining uh, randomly selected uh, variables, and I would use stratified sampling if it was appropriate um, to test the model later on. So I build the model or models using um, you know, AutoML, using a naive Bayes decision tree, random force, wherever I want. 
and then I test that model. I actually make predictions about the past using that model that I've built. I evaluate the model through a number of different model evaluation techniques. We're looking here at a uh, cumulative gains chart. There's also a lift chart. Um, so a number of different ways I could do that. Um, but uh, that's basically it. And I get an accuracy of the model. I'm always reminded of uh, this famous quote from George Box, who said, uh, all models are wrong. In other words, no model is perfect, but, but some are useful. And if you look at the lift over here on these guys, the, 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 the sort of curve of this, the, the random guess would be just a naive uh, straight line across here. So this is saying there's a good sort of incremental value add uh, from, from these models. Uh, then I have a good model. I can, I, can, I can make useful predictions. If I did this modeling process using the drag and drop Oracle Data Miner GUI, it's all embedded in this, in this uh, classification model. So this is build good want. Uh, this is a, a good wine. This, I'm using some Kaggle data here, and I'm trying to predict which is a good bottle of wine or not. And here I have, I guess, a different set of data, because I don't know what the, these guys are just, uh, this is a different set of data, I believe. Oh, no, this is the wine data, greater than 90 points, yeah. Um, and so I built a predictive model, and I get to see, uh, visualize it that way. I can, um, I can do, do this a number of different ways. Um, if I showed you this notebook, which I did before, I'm just, you know, running a model, uh, using those scripts, and, and evaluating the results using... Um, something like this, uh, where I'm comparing the models. So now we're up to week five. We're doing model evaluation. Now this can get arbitrarily, uh, you know, hairy. People have, you know, religious debates uh, about, well, what's the best model? Is it the best model here in the beginning or the best model here at the end where some other model may overtake the other? Uh, what's the false positives, all that? Um, I don't want to get into all that stuff because I think it's, um, you know, argued way too much. I think basically you're going to get a pretty good model regardless. Um, if you take all of our defaults, and of course you can improve it, but you're going to be pretty good um, just taking the defaults as well. And then we're up to week six. six. Okay, so we're almost at the end. Now I'm going to deploy my model, so I'm going to apply the model to predict the best customers. It, it's just this uh, classification model here, uh, making a prediction, and here's all my customers with the probability of them being a, a very good quality customer. Um, here it is in a different way with the SQL, um, SQL worksheets. That's what I showed at the beginning. Just begin a model, apply a model. There's my results. It's straightforward, right? It's just scripts, and, or it's notebooks, or it's workflows that you want to run. There's a number of different ways. And at the end of all this, you know, congratulations. You are a uh, Oracle data scientist. Uh, now, you got to do the homework. you got to, you know, practice these things and keep on going back and, you know, read and practice, follow the tutorials that are out there. And there's a number of links at the end. But you will become, I contend, uh, an Oracle data scientist. And I you know, wish you well that I've seen a lot of people do this and I'm happy to help anybody that needs any help. But wait, wait, there's, there's even more. And part of it is I can use, and I showed some of this earlier, but um, I've got Oracle Application Express that's sitting right alongside on my um, autonomous database. And as I showed before, I'm just gonna use the PowerPoints to kind of speed through this. I can just quickly visualize this as a uh, table or a graph. I can use the faceted search to say, just show me the customers or the employees that are 80% and above that are in the research and development part department who are job level four and whatever. Uh, I could uh, see the attribute importance in a better, more visual way. I think Application Express and Oracle Analytics Cloud are, are much better at the visualizations and the reporting and the deployment of the models. Um, so, so why not just show the results there? Uh, use the right tool for the right job. Uh, um, I think I heard Adelweiss uh, Kamerman say that once, and it just made so much sense. Um, so interactively drill down, maybe I just want to zoom in on those people that are the, really the, the, more, the longer years with the higher probability of, of leaving, and I want to see, uh, if I click on them in the live product, I'll see more information about them, but I can drill right through them. So wonderful, wonderful way to uh, deploy your models. Um, I can even use the REST API um, that comes with the database. and. Uh, deploy this as some sort of application. So the, the sky's the limit. I think what's really exciting is you as an Oracle prof data professional um, know a lot of this. You know a lot of stuff. And the machine learning, I contend, is just an incremental ad, right? It's not that hard. Um, yeah. But wait, there's even more. And I, I got this from Tammy Bedner, I think it was, that it was just, I love this. Wait, there's more. And so here is a, uh, a thing I did with Francesco Tussaud. By the way, the other one back here, I should give credit to this one. This was uh, something I did with Brendan Tierney. Um, it's not much, this is just a screenshot here, but if you Google uh, wine, uh, machine learning, Brendan Tierney or Charlie Burgers, I mean, you'll see a really good video of that. He did some great work there. I did this one with uh, Francesco Tussaud, who's referenced at the bottom, and we were trying to, he was using the Kaggle data set for wine. Now we've since done a little bit more with this. 
but if I spend very, very little money, 20 or $30, uh, using machine learning, I can predict what's going to be a good or a bad bottle of wine. If I want to spend a lot of money, well, I can get a very good bottle of wine, but who wants to spend that much? So the idea is we, we do the analysis in ADW using OML, and now we come back and visualize the results, and we're basically using very interactive visualizations to try and find something like this $17 bottle of wine that has a 94% probability of being a good wine. Right? I have all this data about the wines and the reviews and the price and the variety and the country and so on. I might as well, might as well just make predictions and get much more information out of my database. And I think the, almost the last thing is, the most one of the very exciting things is we've also been partnering with the Oracle Analytics Cloud team. And in 5.7, which just became available, they have added uh, the first of some really exciting integration with uh, Oracle uh, Machine Learning. So now, uh, they have this concept of uh, I, as a data scientist, have been over here on the left building and registering, mo building models inside the database. An OAC user comes in and sees those models, peruses them, and says, aha, I'll take Charlie's expense report fraud model or my employee attrition model, and I will score it against a similar you know, data signature uh, data set here and make predictions. And then I will just do that whole data flow as part of Oracle Analytics Cloud. And uh, without going through any more time to go through this, I, I think if you Google this, you'll see Oracle Analytics Cloud 5.7 registering machine learning models. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful stuff uh, done by Lalitha. Uh, and here I just have some screenshots of my use of it. Uh, I figure out what different models I've made. I can apply it to another set of data. There's a YouTube right here that you can see that. Um, I don't know if I have it floating around here somewhere in another window. I do have it over here. I have sort of a workflow. Um, this is... Uh, Oracle Analytics Cloud, and if this thing hasn't timed out on me or whatever, it'll show, um, maybe I have to refresh this or something, um, it'll show, um, I got to log back in, so I'm going to skip that, but um, it will have uh, all of my projects, all of my uh, data, all my data flows in here, and the idea is I simply go through here, and I think it's up over here where I can register an ML model, and this will take me into an area here where I can say, well, this is the instance of ADW, and there's my naive Bayes attrition model. I register it. I've already done, I think, this one, so I'm going to skip that. And then I set up this data flow, which uh, we don't have enough time to go through everything because I'm watching the clock. So we have the data flow here, which is what I'm showing. Those results stay in the database, and what better tool to visualize and interactively explore those predictions and insights than something like OAC. It's a wonderful product, very easy to use. So in closing, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you do the homework. I hope you study. I hope you do the tutorials. There's a number of hands-on labs and tutorials here and you know kind of like learning how to do something new if you just take it in chunks a week on focus on the business problem take another week on thinking about data preparation uh, read the blog uh, series that i have there's another chapter going out on modeling going out i think this week um, watch the youtubes just kind of read up study on this stuff i think you too uh, can can very easily i think add machine learning to your otherwise very deep and extensive oracle skills um, this is something that we were doing, these TechCast days, they're all public out there. I'm part of this analytics and data Oracle user community. So you can go out there and see all these uh, uh, previously uh, you know, recorded events or follow us on any kind of a TechCast. We had Maria Colgan uh, last Thursday that's out there. And in closing, thank you very, very much for uh, your time and attention. And I'm going to see if I can't uh, see if there's any questions. Um, are there any questions at all, Suzanne? Hi, Charlie. Yes, there are questions. Let me let me read them to you. Um, first question is, is it possible to show a machine learning model based on random forests? How does that work? Well, we have, yeah, uh, I'll go over here real quickly. In the random forest, if, if you say, okay, here's machine learning. I don't know if I ran a random forest right here. Here is how we... Um, here, I think I understand the question, so they're going to say, he doesn't understand the question. I think I do understand it. When I build the model, it's as simple as this, right? I say I want to do a random forest. Um, I specify the type of uh, function I want to do here. I've done it up here in the uh, uh, specifying I want to do a random forest right here, and I have a random forest model. Now, I think the question is, yeah, but random forests are kind of counter, you know, they're, they're kind of like a neural network. They don't really... They're not as, as easy to see and visualize as a decision tree, so we don't have a specific way of doing a random forest. We haven't invented some new visualization technique for a random forest. You would get something like a, a model and say that's a pretty good model. But I do think we have something that is very, very useful. I'm almost glad you asked that because this is a naive base, but it could just as easily have been a random forest. 
we have something called prediction detail. So here's a guy here, 93% likely to do whatever we're predicting here, I think, buy insurance or something. And the reasons are if, 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 if. So this is something we call prediction details. If you Google prediction underscore details, you'll see it uh, in the documentation. Send me a note if you can't find it. And uh, that would be our interpretability for each prediction, not a global model. The global model would give you the coefficients and such, but, but um, yeah, we do it and that's how we do it. Okay, great. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, next question is, is there any output integration with Oracle's graphing software? When you say graphing software, I assume they mean the graph database. Um, I may have that wrong, so I'll answer it both ways. The graph, the Oracle spatial and graph uh, is not explicitly integrated with what we do, although we keep on talking about trying to do a you know, better and tighter integration of that. Way, the way that you could do that perhaps is if these things here were, were more like uh, graph relationships. Uh, and I know I got the thing on the wrong way here, but if these were graph relationships, rather than I'm going to save that as sales, tra I got the caps on here, sales uh, transactions, um, then uh, uh, then, then what I would do is aggregate that data over here and bring them on in as like, how many times did you have uh, uh, um, relationships with people on my bad list, stuff like that. So we do have the ability to do that. We just, and I, I guess we have customers that I believe are doing that. I just don't have a data set or a demo of it myself, but it would come in uh, as graph data that way. Now, if the question was different and it meant like, can you graph any of the data? I would say, well, yeah, what I showed was in uh, Oracle um, uh, Apex or Oracle Analytics Cloud and so on. But I, I think they meant the former question, I'm, I'm guessing. Any more? Okay, thank you. And then, are all the libraries for our Python SQL are installed, or do I have to install whichever I decide to use? Can you, yeah. It, 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 yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it, it depends on what, where you are and what you're using. On premises, we have the Oracle R integration, which is what I'm showing you here. And we come, we ship it with certain packages um, and they come pre-installed, pre-checked and, and, and work on premises. And if you want to add in your own with, with, with admin privileges, you can go down to your admin and add in whatever you want and off you go. And like, uh, I think Kaisha Bank is a public reference that does a lot of that. And you can go Google that on the Oracle machine learning uh, customer successes page. You can see a lot, you know, in their own presentation slides and stuff. And you know, other guys, Z uh, Zaba Bank is out there too. You can see what they do there. Um, on the Python, and so this will move to the autonomous database in the months to come, but it's not there yet. So the answer to the R is only an on premises or a database as a cloud service. You can also have DBA Prince to do whatever you want. On um, in the Python, um, it's on the autonomous database, so we have to be a lot more locked down there now. We're working on ways to have to allow you to add more and more things there, and we will solve that uh, in the future. But as this goes to market, let's say in the very near future, we can't really say things as explicitly as they used to. In the very, very near future, this will go to market with these packages here. And if you want more than that, we, you know, our plan is to add more, but also allow you to do it yourself. But init initially, for the next several months, it will be a little bit more locked down. Because the autonomous database, we don't want you to break things so much. Any other questions? Uh, yes, you have quite a few. Um, Given the are, are there a way for Python, can I see the questions somewhere? Sorry, I'm, trying to see, I'm just trying to see where I can. You see should be able to under Q and A. I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. just I got seeing them up windows, for you. So, okay, over here Q and A. Aha, got it. Oh, sorry, I, I am probably. There we go. Uh, um, so I'm. So you can't. Okay, so given the expected list of Python packages, can customers install it? Yeah, I think I just answered that. How much time commitment per week? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. No one's ever asked me that. Well, I'm trying to uh, uh, learn how to play the guitar, and if I play it for 10 minutes, I'm not going to get very good. Uh, the way I guess I thought of that was two, three, four hours a week, just kind of reading, studying, you know, spending a little time going through the, the tutorials. Each of those tutorials is supposed to take you like a half an hour to 45 minutes. Now you probably have to set up, you're probably going to interrupt it and everything, but good question. Um, I would say at least two hours, you know, three hours, you know, spend 20 minutes a day during your lunch break, follow this stuff, just spend some time on it. Think about it. Also Google, read up on it. We will have a course, but I think this is very attainable. I really, most of my customer references are guys that, you know, could speak SQL before or knew the database, but didn't know machine learning rather than the guys that are hardcore data scientists that were trying to learn the database. I think there's far more to learn in the, in the, in the database side of things, like even privileges and stuff like that. 
Uh, here's a question. I am curious whether an OCI Data Science Cloud fits in the machine learning roadmap. Yeah, it does, but it, they're, they are separate paths, separate products right now. If you don't know, OCI Data Science is um, is using open source Python and putting a Jupyter notebook in front of that, and you can get GPUs, and it's wonderful, cool stuff, but it, it doesn't yet really um, talk to the in-database functions, but because we both speak Python in our roadmap, we would merge those, not merge, um, we would integrate those two products uh, more tightly together, but that is a, a roadmap function rather than something you can, you can do today. Uh, how does one tune the hyperparameters in a selected model as the standard package shows uh, show and support them? Um, the, in the auto ML, we're going to do a lot of that for you. Uh, exactly how, I guess, that's kind of hard to explain. It's, it has this gradient kind of uh, uh, um, functions and such that, that are you know beyond my uh, ability to, uh, by beyond my build, ability, let's just leave it there. Um, but if you want to do it mechanically or manually, you can you know, say, I want a linear or a Gaussian, I want feature selection on or, or ridge regression enabled, and you just shotgun them all if you want to. I would say, if you take all the defaults, we're going to give you a pretty good answer. Uh, did I said the link? Uh, I think I put the links in there. Did I already do that? I think I had all these links right here, maybe. Uh... You did, and just so everybody knows, I will be sending out. Okay, and I saw, let's see, are there, uh, is, are, is this introduction for six weeks, what was the cost? Oh, the co there's no cost, I mean, just read the blog, follow the tutorials, uh, uh, the PowerPoint I think we have out there, so you can just click on all the links on that. Uh, do you have case studies for ML and higher ed? Yeah, there's, there's, if you go to the Oracle website, that, I mean, cases and public cases are two different things in machine learning, right? Because a lot of guys use this stuff, but they don't want anybody to know about it. It's really kind of the most interesting thing. Um, and so not everybody's using it everywhere, but more people are using it than you sometimes realize. Uh, the ones that are kind enough to come out and talk about what they're doing are a few far and fewer between, but Valdosta State uh, spoke at our analytics and data uh, Oracle user community a year or two ago. And if you Google that, Valdosta State Oracle Machine Learning, you'll see it. Uh, I think it was Brian, his name will come back to me, did a, a, an absolute super presentation about about how to uh, predict uh, students that were likely, uh, you know, having problems. Um, and he had a whole dashboard he built up with OBIE. It was really wonderful work. I have also worked with a number of other different universities, um, at least to help them, you know, show them what it is. I don't know how much they, they ran with it, but I know some consultants, um, like Brendan Tierney, I think, had published some stuff that he had done with some universities over in England predicting student dropout, things like that. So um, a lot of good use cases there. I, I do think on the higher ed, you have the probability that the that the student will be accepted, you know, will come to your college if you accept them, times the probability that the student will do well, times the, pro the, the probability they will graduate and be a, a, a large donor. So I think if you take those three models and put them all together, you, you've got the right student you want to pick. Um, can we build ML models with inconsistent complete data? Yeah, in, in terms of uh, if you have missing values, uh, we will replace the missing value by default if you use the ADP with the uh, uh, with the uh, mean or the uh, mode in general. If you want to do something else, you can you can do that. But uh, yeah, uh, in fact, in in sparse data like the transactional data, like the UK National Healthcare does that, um, you may have uh, transactional data. It, it, it may be very sparse if if you put them in each each drug into a column, but people don't store the data that way. They store it as as, as transactional data and they join it. So. Um, I think that's it. I think we're kind of probably way over time. I don't see a whole uh, a lot of stuff here. Thank you. Uh, great session. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, and uh, send me a note at charlie.berger at oracle.com if you have any follow-up or you know questions or can't find anything. Uh, if you go with all the links and you just kind of allocate the time, I think you'll have a very good time. And uh, and, and, and again, this stuff's free. So there's no reason that by you know the end of this week, you guys can't all have analyzed all the, the world's uh, data and solved all of our problems. So good luck. With that, I, I will I will uh, put it on pause. So thank you, Suzanne, and everyone. Thanks, for Charlie. Thanks everyone for joining.